Now see, it's funny, and this happened a few times with me. Sometimes I do it, I plan on doing a video. And I'll be in one mood or one frame of mind. But then, for better or for worse, I'll listen to something or read something. It could be a comment in my comment section, somebody else's podcast, somebody else's live stream, something that an email follower sent me. Then it changes my mood somewhat. So, without getting lengthy, some videos I do that include me doing some variation of an angry rant don't initially start out that way. They don't initially start out that way. There's some videos I've done where I didn't initially plan on doing an angry rant up until maybe an hour or two hours before I recorded that video. But anyway, okay, I know most of y'all saying, Alan, okay, you got to be referring to something. What are you referring to? Two things. Two things get, get your boy Alan Roger Curry a little riled up before I start recording this video. Two things. One, I was listening to a live stream. I didn't hear the whole thing. I heard excerpts. And as you know, I did a video where that was a response to Tony Maceo from Max City Limits where he had made the comment that dating coaches, he felt like dating coaches were useless. And of course, I did a whole response video to that that you can find on my YouTube channel. But just this morning, I heard a guy saying essentially the same thing. I heard a guy saying essentially the same thing. Now, I can't see, now I can't remember. I can't remember if it was the podcast host himself or one of his, his listeners and followers who said it. But he said that he didn't use those exact words useless, but he's, I think he said overrated. And he basically went on to say he don't, he don't understand why men pay for the services of dating coaches. Why are you worrying about what other motherfuckers do with their money? That's what I want to know. To the motherfuckers that keep taking jabs in my career. Why are you worried about what other people do with their money? Now, that's one thing if you yourself individually say, hey, I've examined what a lot of dating coaches have to offer, relationship advisors and coaches have to offer, and I just don't feel like their services are worth my money. Now, if you say that, I'm not going to have any criticism of you because you're talking about what's valuable to you, what's worth your money or not worth your money. I have no, I have no complaint with that. I have no criticism of that. But when you take, when you go beyond yourself, and you start critiquing how other, what what products and services other people are spending their money on, then that's when I got a problem. That's when I got a problem. Why the fuck you worried about how other people spend their money? Just worry about your motherfucking money. <laughs> worry about your money. Like, I've never paid for the services of a health and fitness trainer. But you would never hear me say that I think health and fitness trainers are useless or overrated. I, I used to work at a health club when I lived in Los Angeles. My last year in Los Angeles, I, I used to work for a health club called LA Fitness. Now, I wasn't a health and fitness trainer. I was actually in sales. I was in membership sales. But a lot of my friends at the club were health and fitness trainers. And see, it's funny, speaking of this, they used to get hated on a lot. Just like dating coaching as a career gets hated on a lot, back in the day, health and fitness trainers used to get hated on. I would say to a certain extent, they still get hated on. Yeah, because me and my friends at the health club, they used to talk about that all the time, man. A lot of guys would say, oh, man, why you need to pay money for a health and fitness trainer? Can't you just exercise on your own? Why you need a health and fitness trainer? Why you need a personal nutritionist? Can't you just eat right on your own? 
Why you need to hire a personal chef? Like LeBron James, he has a personal chef and a personal nutritionist. A lot of professional athletes have those. Matter of fact, a lot of professional athletes have trainers. Now you would think guys who are in shape like that would need a personal chef or a personal nutritionist or, or, or a trainer. Steph Curry has a trainer. Almost all NBA players and NFL players have personal trainers and personal nutritionists. But yet, I've heard a lot of people hate on those careers. I know a lot of people be hating on those careers and be like, oh man, why you need a personal nutritionist or a personal chef? Why you need a personal trainer? Shit, for that matter, you might as well go ahead and hate on all coaches. Why, why do the Golden State Warriors need a coach on the bench? They know how to play basketball, don't they? Why you need a coach on the bench? They know the fundamental skills of basketball, dribbling, rebounding, playing defense. Why do they need a coach on the bench? Let alone a coach and three assistant coaches. Why do they need them on the bench? Why don't you just go ahead and get rid of them? Huh? Can't you work on your own car? Why do you need an auto mechanic for? I know how to work on my own car. Do you? Why do you need an auto mechanic for? For that matter, why don't you keep yourself healthy? Why do you need to go to a doctor for? Why do you need a doctor? Why do you need a family physician for? Huh? You know, they got this thing now called DoorDash where they deliver your food. Can't you go pick up your own food? Don't you think DoorDash and Uber Eats is useless? How come your lazy ass can't go pick up your own motherfucking food? Why do you need that shit for? Matter of fact, why do you need an Uber driver for? Can't you get your own transportation? Why do you need a fucking cab driver? They might as well be useless. Why do you need a remote control? Can't you get up off your fucking couch and turn the TV? Huh? Why do you need a remote control? Why are remote controls useless? Shut the fuck up. You stupid motherfuckers. You stupid, hating ass motherfuckers. Yeah, I'm telling you. Give me your phone number and I'll tell you directly if you want me to. You stupid motherfucker. And all you motherfuckers talking with your fake ass name. See this? See this degree? You see that's my real birth certificate name on my Indiana University degree? Because I use my real motherfucking name, niggas. And I see y'all made me use the N-word. All these niggas talking shit on YouTube, but yet they using these fake names. These street names. These pseudonyms. Motherfucker, what's your real birth certificate name? What's the name on your high school diploma, motherfucker? Talking all this shit. Got motherfuckers lit. A lot of y'all, I'm gonna blame the people following these motherfuckers. Y'all listen to motherfuckers, y'all don't even know their real name. Y'all don't even know these motherfuckers' real name. Y'all don't know what city they grew up in. Don't know what high school they went to. All that shit's in my Wikipedia page. Gary, Indiana, baby. Proud of it. Gary, Indiana. It's my hometown. Work high school. Class of 1981. Motherfuckers know my biographical. Do they know yours? You creating this YouTube character that nobody knows the fuck? For all people know, you could be an abuser of animals. How would anybody know? They don't know your fucking real name. You could be a convicted rapist, a convicted pedophile. How would anybody know? They don't know your real fucking name. You could be anything. You could be a petty... Grocery store thief. How would anybody know? They don't know your fucking real name. I know some of y'all like, damn, that was starting off the video going into rant mode. You damn right I am. Because I'm tired of all these motherfuckers talking shit, man. Just yik yakky, yik yakky. I think daily coaches are overrated. I don't see why men need to pay. Nigga, what do you do? When you're working at McDonald's, do people hate on your job? When you're delivering pizzas for pizza, do people hate on you? I already been through this with Tony Maceo, man. I could go down the list of jobs that technically, I already pointed out one. The dude at the fucking um, car wash who goes like this. I don't need that motherfucker. I don't need that motherfucker guide me into the damn car wash. Why do I need him? Why when I go to a nightclub and go to the bathroom, I got a motherfucker handing me a tissue expecting me to give him a dollar tip? I don't need that motherfucker, man. But hey, that's his hustle. So, hey, if he making a living, God bless him. I think if anybody earning a living 
as opposed to being broke, unemployed, and homeless, God bless them. That's why I try not to hate on people's jobs. Because I'm, I'm thankful that anybody is earning a living. I've been homeless before. I've admitted that on my YouTube channel. When I lived in Los Angeles, I was homeless three times. Not for long, thank God. Some people homeless for weeks, months, years. My well, longest I was homeless, I was homeless once for about 36 to 48 hours. I was homeless another time for about 24 to 36 hours. And I was homeless another time for about 18 to 24 hours. I know how it feels to be homeless. I know how it feels to be broke. I'm thankful to be earning a living. A good living at that. So yeah, it irritates me when I hear people hating on my career. What are you contributing to society? That's what I want to know. All these people talking shit. What are you contributing to society that's worthwhile? That you got time to hate on my career. What are you contributing to society? What? What? Talk to me. I'm listening. What are you contributing to society? I got emails where people say I transformed their life. Me and my brother was just talking about this yesterday. He was talking about all the emails I've received over the last few years. People say, Allie, man, you totally changed my life. You've transformed my life. My life is totally different today because of you, Alan Roger Curry. Do you got emails like that? Huh? Do you got emails like that? Lengthy emails like that? Show them to me then. Or shut the fuck up. Your no credibility ass with your fake name, your fake street name. You ain't know who you are, nigga. <laughs> Ooh, man, I was great. I was great to say something real below the belt, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a chill out right now. So that's one thing. That got me irritated. And again, I wasn't even planning on going on this little, now it's like a, what, a 11, 12 minute rant. Second thing, speaking of hating on my career, now I got to bring up this brother's name. I ain't plan on bringing up his name again, but I'm going to bring him his name again. And it's not so much I got beef with this brother as much as his followers, man. I'm just saying, I'm going to say it bluntly and publicly, man. A lot of guys who follow Alpha male strategies, y'all are irritating as fuck. Y'all are irritating as fuck to me. And again, that's not really a direct jab at him because he don't control who follow him. But some of, the, some of the guys who call themselves, maybe they're not even real followers of Maybe they're just trolls pretending to be followers of his. But do you know every week I get at least five to ten comments from guys who claim to be Followers of AMS. Anyway, some guy wrote me and said, Alan, this re relates to that video where I was responding to Tony Maceo. He said, Alan, you seem like you don't like people hating on, on you for being a dating coach, but aren't you being hypocritical because you be hating on alpha male strategies? I've heard you on your videos hating on alpha male strategies. So, Technically, you're hating on somebody who is in your own profession. Really? Insert dog face here. I ain't never hated on alpha male strategies. Contrary to popular belief. I ain't never hated on that motherfucker. Well, I would say this. It depends on what you call how you define hating on somebody. I have never hated on alpha male strategies as a dating coach. And if anybody says that, show me a quote where I did. I, if I was hating on him as a dating coach, you would hear me make something, say something to the effect of, I don't believe alpha male strategies should be a dating coach. Or I think alpha male strategies is a poor, ineffective dating coach. That would be representative of me hating on him. I have never hated on alpha male strategies. For the millionth time, here are my only two issues that I've ever had with alpha male strategies. It really, 
I can, if I wanted to be nitpicky, I can name more issues. But if I had to narrow it down to just two issues, it would be this. Number one, I have just an ongoing philosophical disagreement with what he encourages and condones, which is lying to women and misleading and manipulating women, which is the basis for his sleazeball gang philosophy. Sleazeball gang philosophy. That's what a sleazeball is, is a liar and a manipulator. Now, I had some guys say, well, Alan, you must don't keep up with Alpha Male Strategy's recent videos because recently he don't really tell guys to lie to women no more. And he don't really tell guys to mislead and manipulate women no more. He actually, actually promotes a high degree of honesty. Well, yeah, I've heard a few guys say supposedly in the last three, four, five months, he's been slowly but surely changing his tune. If that's true, more power to him. But, but the fact remains, that ain't how he started out. And everybody know, everybody who's been keeping up with him since the beginning of his career, know that ain't that, that's how. Now, I can't speak for what he's been encouraging and condoning the last two months, three months, four months, five months. But I know for a fact, matter of fact, somebody just sent me on Twitter last week. Somebody sent me a tweet of one of his old videos where he specifically said, he said, I'm all about getting pussy any way I can. If that means lying to women, manipulating them, toying with their emotions. I don't give a fuck. I'm all about getting pussy. Any, he said that specifically on a video from the early part of 2018 when he first became a dating coach. And that's how he was pretty much most of 2018. Again, I can't speak for how he's been in 2019. But I know for a fact, for the vast majority of 2018, Alvin Australia is all about telling men to lie to women and do whatever they can to get in their pants. And I have a philosophical disagreement with that. That doesn't mean I don't think he should be a dating coach, though. I've never said because of that he shouldn't be a dating coach. I just make the point that I philosophically disagree with that stance. So that's my number one issue. Which is just, I just try, But I've had that with a lot of dating coaches and pickup artists. So he ain't the only one. Like, more notable than him would be this guy named Yad, who's a, a indirect dating pickup artist slash dating coach from London. He's the same way. He, he believes in basically bullshitting women and manipulating women to get them in bed. I used to go after Yad all the time. I'm probably in my history, I've gone after Yad probably three times as much as I've gone after alpha male strategies, if not more so. So in terms of, under the category of philosophical disagreements, there's a lot of PUAs and dating coaches I've gone after. But that's, to me, I distinguish that from hating. That's not hating. I don't consider having a philosophical disagreement with somebody as hating. I'm never going as far as to say Alvin Mel Strategy should resign as a dating coach or he should retire as a dating coach. I've never said that. I actually did one video where I encouraged people to buy his book. So how could I be hating on him if I actually was encouraged? I did one video. I can't remember the title of the video, but I actually did a video where I was encouraging people to buy Alpha Male Strategies book. Now, of course, part of it was self-serving because I first said, buy my books first. So that was the first thing I said. I said, I want you to buy my books first and then go ahead and buy Alpha Male Strategies book and see what you think. And I basically said, if you read his book and you find that his advice resonates with you more than the contents of my four books, then I, I actually said, I said, go ahead and follow up on my strategy, he said. I actually said that on the video. I said, if you feel after reading my books or listening to my four audio books, and then you listen to Alpha Male Strategies audiobook and you find that his advice resonates with you more than the contents and advice contained in my book, I said, go ahead and follow him. I say that with any dating coach. I always tell people that. I never, that's one thing I can say for myself as a dating coach. I rarely have ever have told somebody, don't follow this person or don't read their book. The only exception, and I've pointed this out before, the only time I've had an exception to that is if I find out that a dating coach or pickup artist is promoting something along the lines of rape, date rape, sexual assault, 
getting women sloppy drunk and then taking advantage of them or putting drugs in their food or drinks and then taking advantage. If they, if any pickup artist or dating coach promotes something like that, then yeah, that's what I will tell you specifically. Don't follow that person. Don't follow that person. Yeah, anything that's related to rape, date rape, sexual assault, or some of that nature, I, I, I'll never, I'll never co-sign with that shit. But other than that, I rarely have ever will tell guys who listen to me, don't read this guy's book. I always want guys to read other people's book in addition to my books. Most of the time, more often than not, I encourage people to read other people's ebooks, other people's paperbacks, or listen to other people's audiobooks, assuming they have one. Now, the reality is some dating coaches don't even have that shit. I talked about that in a recent video. You've got some people who promote themselves as a dating coach. They don't have not one ebook. They don't have not one paperback. They don't have not one audiobook. So my question is, how the fuck are they even promoting themselves as a dating coach? And you ain't got no book to fall back on. That's problematic in itself. Matter of fact, Alvin Mastrangi started out that way. Now he has a book. Matter of fact, I already got two books now. I already got a second book that deals with money and financial management and that type of shit. It ain't got nothing to do with dating. It's about money. But when Alvin Mastrangi first started out, he didn't have shit as far as books are concerned. He didn't have no ebook. He didn't have no paperback. He didn't have no audiobook. Now he does, but he didn't when he started out. See, I, I didn't go that route, man. I see a lot of guys do this. They'll market themselves as a dating coach first, and then they'll come out with a book. See, I did just the opposite, which to me is the right way to do it. I came out with my books first. Then I promoted myself as a dating coach, not vice versa. I came out with my first ebook in May of 1999, my Mo one, my first Mo one ebook came out in May of 1999, and then the paperback version came out in late February, early March of 2006, and then the audiobook version came out in uh, August of 2014. Now I came out with my book first, then I marketed myself as a dating coach, which technically is what you're supposed to do. If you're any type of self-help guru, you I told you, and this is not just my opinion, if there's at least one other person who said this, was Tony Robbins. That's what Tony Robbins said. He said, you should never be marketing yourself as a self-help guru if you ain't got no book. He said, you're supposed to come out with a book first, then market yourself as a self-help guru. Not market yourself as a self-help guru and then come out with a book. So anyway, that, going back to AMS for a second, that's the first thing issue I've had with him. I just had a philosophical disagreement with his whole sleazeball gang philosophy. The second major issue I had why it was provoked me to bring up his name a lot, speaking of my books, he be biting off a lot of my shit, man. Everybody know it. I mean, it's like commonplace now. Do you know in the last, I don't know, I'd say, I say roughly seven to eight months, I would say starting with October of last year, that's when I would say roughly first started, starting with October of last year up until now, I've had somewhere between 40 to 50 guys, 40 to 50 guys, which compared to the number of people who follow AMS, that's a drop in the bucket, that ain't many. But that's still, to me, a significant number of guys. I've had no less than 40 and as many as 50 plus guys that were initially following AMS until they got my book, The Possibility of Sex. And then they they they, they wrote me or we did a Skype consultation. They was like, Alan, man, I don't know if you know, bro. But do you know when it comes to the talking point about valuing your non-sexual time, attention, and companionship and not giving women free access to your non-sexual time, attention, and companionship and uh, basically just that whole notion of making women work for your non-sexual time, attention, and companionship. Do you know before I be get your book, the possibility of sex, I thought AMS was the originator of that talking point. Man, I've had at least 40 to 50 plus guys that have told me that they, before they became familiar with my book, 
They thought AMS was the originator of that talking point. But because he was stealing all my time. Now, I always like to give him partial credit. Now, in, in 2018, a lot of guys would say, Alan, I've actually heard AMS encourage people to buy at least two of your books. They, he would encourage guys to buy your book, The Possibility of Sex and The Beta Male Revolution. I never heard him encourage guys to buy Mo One. I never heard him encourage guys to buy it. Who uh, said again? But I've heard AMS encourage guys to buy The Possibility of Sex and The Beta Male Revolution. I've heard him myself endorse the beta male revolution. I don't know if I've heard him directly endorse the possibility of sex, but I, he did a whole video in the early part of 2018 where he endorsed the beta male revolution. I know that for a fact. I know for a fact he did endorse the beta male revolution. And I heard from guys last year that he also endorsed the possibility of sex. I haven't heard that so much this year in 2019. I heard that in 2018. I haven't heard that in 2019. But that's the only, the second biggest issue I had with him is that he'd be repeating, regurgitating, and, and in many ways verbally plagiarizing a lot of my material from my book, The Possibility of Sex. So, yeah, that's, that's, the, so that's the only two issues I've ever really had with AMS. And if you want to categorize those two issues as representative of hate raid, then so be it, but I don't consider that hater rate. Yeah, I just had a philosophical disagreement with him about the whole lying to women thing to get them in bed and manipulating women to get them in bed. And secondly, I want anybody who repeats, regurgitates, and or ver verbally plagiarizes my shit to give me my proper credit attribution. I ain't looking for money from these guys. I just want people to give me my what's known as proper credit attribution. That's what you're supposed to do. When you borrow other uh, an established book author's talking points, his terminology, his philosophy, his phrases, his slogans and shit, what you, the minimum thing you're supposed to do is give him proper credit attribution. Otherwise, you're guilty of plagiarism. If you don't, if you if you're basically talking about stuff I talk about in my books and on my videos but you're not mentioning my name, then you're plagiarizing me, which is illegal. And the fact of the matter is, when it comes to the whole, this whole talking point about valuing your non-sexual time, attention, and companionship, there's a lot of motherfuckers on YouTube who copy my shit. Now, I'm gonna just lay it out there. I ain't gonna hold no punches. I was the first motherfucker in the manosphere that had that talking point. And I dare anybody to say that they was talking about that shit before me. I dare you to. I dare you to. You know me, I'm going to say the triple dare. I triple dare you to. I triple dare any motherfucker, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, I dare any motherfucker in the manosphere to say that they had the talking point of valuing your non-sexual time, attention, companionship before this brother you listening to right here. I dare you to. If you try to tell me that you were, first thing I'm going to say, show me your book. Show me your book. If you can't show me your book, shut the fuck up. Peace. If you try to say you talked about it on an audio podcast or an internet radio episode, I'm going to say show it to me so I can see the date of it. Because I was talking about this shit on blog talk radio between 2007 and 2016. Show me your audio podcast. Show me your video podcast. I want to see the specific date on it. If you, if you want to claim you was talking about this shit before me. What nobody in the manosphere talking about the specific talking point of valuing your non-sexual time, attention, and companionship before this brother right here. Nigga, I was talking about that shit as far back as 1988. Yes, let me repeat that. I, st I first came up with the, the philosophy of no free attention back in summer of 1988. It's in my book. If you read Possibly Sex, actually... Speaking of proper credit attribution, I'm going to give proper credit attribution. I actually didn't come up with that phrase, no free attention. So let me be honest in that, saying that. I didn't come up with that phrase. I was the one who popularized it, but I did not. It was actually a coworker of mine that I worked with in downtown Chicago in 1988. 
His name was Anthony. Kind of looked like he could be Eddie Murphy's first cousin. Yeah, a guy named Anthony. And I explained that. That's all in my book, The Possibility of Sex. And so by me mentioning his name in the book, I gave him his proper credit attribution. But yeah. But as far as starting with the advent of the internet and, and, and for what's now known as the manosphere, I would say I was the originator of that talking point, starting with the advent of the internet and the advent of the manosphere. I was the originator of that talking point, the no free attention and valuing, placing high value on your non-sexual time, attention and companionship. And I was the one who specifically correlated it with my manipulative time wasters. Now that's, that's my original thing. That had nothing to do with Anthony. Anthony didn't, he didn't even had nothing to do with my five archetypes. I came with those five archetypes on my own. Reciprocator, rejector, wholesome pretender, erotic hypocrite, and manipulative time waster. But yeah, there wasn't nobody in this manosphere space on either in book form, audio podcast form, internet radio form, or video podcast form that was talking about that before me. If you think they were, list their name in my comment section. List their name and give me documented proof. List the name of their book and what year their book was copyrighted. If it's an audio podcast or internet radio episode, give me the link so I can see what date is attached to it. Or if it's a video podcast, show me the date. Send me the link so I can see the date of when they was talking about Without putting value in your non-sexual time, attention, and companionship. I'm telling you, wasn't nobody talking about that before me. Wasn't nobody talking about that shit before me. As I've said before, when I first hit the scene in the manosphere, what's now known as the manosphere, the number one thing most people were talking about was simply how to get laid. That was the only thing really people were talking about, was simply how to get laid. And more specifically, how to get laid without being a, a woman's husband, fiance, or boyfriend. That was the main talking point in the manosphere when I first got into the manosphere. Was was mainly stuff related to simply how to get laid, and specifically how to get laid without being a woman's husband, fiance, or long-term boyfriend. That was the main talking point when I first got into manosphere. Other than that, people. Other than that, people weren't talking about shit. Like sexual duplicity, wasn't really nobody talking about sexual duplicity. Social programming, wasn't nobody talking about that shit. Even talking dirty. I was the first main person to really talk about talking dirty to women, man. Wasn't nobody really talking about that. There were some guys that would talk about how to talk dirty to a woman while you were in bed fucking her. But as far as talking about talking dirty to a woman... In the very first conversation, like me, wasn't nobody talking about that before me. And again, if you think somebody was, tell me about their book. Tell me about their audio podcast or internet radio episode or tell me about their video podcast with dates attached to them. Or shut the fuck up. Now, speaking of no free attention, I had a bunch of people in the last two, three days send me this article that the New York Post wrote, basically confirming what I already knew for 20 plus years, 30 plus years. The, the article came out saying that at least one third of women only go out on dates with women <clears throat> to get free food. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Come on, man. I mean, I, I'm, it's nice that the New York Post wrote that article, but I mean, come on, man. For a brother like me who's 56 years old, dude, I figured that shit out by the time I was in my early to mid-20s. You're talking about back in the 1980s. All the shit that that article talked about, I knew all that shit back in the 1980s, bro. Again, a lot of the stuff. See, that's what's funny to me being an older brother like myself. A lot of the stuff that younger guys talk about on YouTube and talk about it like it's a fairly new thing, a fairly new concept. Well, 
in respect to them, it probably is. If you like 21 years old or 25 years old, 29 years old, even 35 years old, a lot of stuff, you're just learning about women's true nature. So it's going to seem new to you. But again, since I'm 56 years old, man, a lot of stuff that younger guys are just figuring out about women, I figured out back in the 80s, man. Some stuff as far back as my senior in high school, which would have been the 1980, 1981 school year. Yeah, that's when I first officially learned about sexual duplicity was back in my senior in high school because I used to have women who had boyfriends used to throw pussy at me. Yeah, I had girls who had long-term boyfriends. They used to just throw pussy at me, hand it to me on a silver platter. That's when I first realized how sexually duplicitous women were. And then after that was the summer after my senior in high school when I watched Talk Dirty to Me. That solidified my knowledge of the concept of sexual duplicity. But yeah, man, a lot of shit that guys be talking about, and they, they, they sometimes say it to me like, like, like I don't know, or like I just learned about this shit five years ago or 10 years ago. And I, I don't want to be mean to these young guys, but I'm like, motherfucker, y'all y'all talking to me about shit that I've known about, man, since I was in my 20s, man, since the 80s, man, before y'all motherfuckers was even born. I knew about manipulative time wasters before a lot of you motherfuckers was born. I knew about sexually duplicitous women before a lot of you guys were even born. I knew about red pill shit before it was even called red pill. I knew about the difference between a blue pill and a red pill mindset before it even, they start labeling, labeling that red pill. Like my term for what people now call red pill knowledge and wisdom, I used to simply call in the know. That was my main nickname for that. If I talked to a guy and I felt like he had a very enlightened and realistic view on women and their behavior and their true sexual nature and their true manipulative and uh, materialistic nature. I would simply say, oh, so you in the know. That would be my thing. I would say, oh, so you in the know. That's what I would call it. I would say, oh, this, like if I was talking to somebody else, I'd say, oh, this, you need to be my brother right here, Ralph. His name is Ralph, man. He in the know. He know what's up. He in the know. That was my way of saying Ralph is red pill. That's what I would say instead of saying red pill, blue pill. I would say this guy's in the know. Or if you're a blue pill, I would just simply call you naive. I would say, oh, that dude's naive. He's still wet behind the ears. He's still wet behind the ears. He's naive. So that was my old school terms for what they now call red pill versus blue pill. I would either say if you were red pill, I would say you were in the know or you know what's up. Or if you were blue pill, I would say uh, he's naive or he's still wet behind the ears. Um, speaking of red pill, I had some guys over the weekend watch my last video. And they said, Alan, not too many guys. I think it was two guys, no more than three guys asked me. They said, Alan, don't you think being married and or having children is antithetical to being red pill? Don't you think that if you believe in marriage or believe in having children, that means you ain't truly red pill? That means you're either blue pill or at minimum you're purple pill? How can you be red pill and still believe in marriage or the idea of having children? That ain't quite dog face worthy, so I'm going to spare you the dog face for that question. But no, you don't know. I know a few people that are red pill that are married. I can name two people just off the top of my head who I would generally consider red pill that are married. And have children. Uh... Rolo Tomasi, matter of fact, Rolo Tomasi is considered, damn, I thought I turned shit off.
Romo Tomasi is considered the godfather of the red pill community, even though a lot of people debate that. Like I saw somebody recently say, no, I think Tom Likas is the godfather of red pill knowledge, wisdom, insight, and advice. Shit, I disagree with both of them. Shit. Because truthfully, I had, I had a good share of red pill knowledge wisdom and insight before I ever heard of both Tom Likas and Rolo Tomasi. So shit, you could argue that shit. I'm the motherfucking godfather of uh, Red Pill, even though most people already gave me one godfather name. I'm considered, a lot of people in the manosphere call me the godfather of direct verbal game, which I gladly accept that title. But, um, but yeah, I knew about what's known as Red Pill knowledge before I ever heard of Tom Likas or Rolo. Again, man, I would say I was red pill back in the 80s. In the mid to late 80s was when I first became red, what people now call red pill. I would say technically as early as 1980, 81. That's when I was at least on the tip of the iceberg of becoming red pill. And I would say by no later than roughly 84, 85, 86, I was red pill. And that was way before I heard it. But anyway, that's another segue. But anyway, I was on the subject of people who are considered red pill that are married. Rolo Tomasi is married and got a daughter. And his nickname is the godfather of the red pill community. Stina Day Williams, my fellow dating coach. Stina Day Williams, he's been married since 1999, 20 years. He got like four kids. Yeah, he got four kids. No, he got five. Yeah, because he got a, he has a daughter from a previous marriage because he's been married twice. He got one daughter from a previous marriage, and then he got four kids, two sons and two daughters from his current wife. And he shit. I dare anybody to say Stevie D. Williams is blue pill. He's definitely not blue pill for damn sure. And I would say for the most part, he ain't purple pill. I've never heard Stevie D. Williams give what most people call purple pill advice. I ain't never heard him give purple pill advice. He's very realistic about the concept of marriage and raising kids. So you can be, I would even throw my brother in there. My brother. I would have, at minimum, I would say my brother is on the borderline between red pill and purple pill. If he's not full-fledged red pill, I would say he's on the borderline between being red pill and purple pill. Again, purple pill is when you have a lot of red pill knowledge, wisdom, and insight, but you tend to publicly promote stuff that could be considered blue pill advice. That would make you purple pill. Yeah, my brother, he's, I would say at minimum, he's on the borderline between being red pill and purple pill. He kind of, he is a little bit purple pill because he don't really believe in casual sex. He believes all guys should settle down with a wife at some point. Like he, he, he doesn't like the fact that I'm still out here just fucking. <laughs> His ideal situation would be for me to find a wife and get married and settle down. So in that way, some people can argue that, you know, he's a little bit lightheartedly purple pill. Yeah, he, he don't like to see guys going well into their 40s and 50s and 60s just straight up fucking without getting married at least once. Um, but no, Stephen D. Williams, yeah, man, he's red pill and he's married and got five kids. So I disagree with people who say that, man. You can be red pill and be married. Just because you're married doesn't mean you automatically become naive or, or unrealistic or idealistic. Shit, you think Hugh Hefner was blue pill? That motherfucker was married like three times. Tom Likas, Tom Likas is as red pill as they come. That motherfucker was married like two or three times. He's since divorced each of his wives, but still he was married. So how can you say that somebody, because they're, um, choose to get married or choose to have children, that makes them 
either blue pill or a minimum purple pill. I disagree with that, man. I totally disagree with that. No, that's bullshit. So I'm going to end it here, the free portion. Oh, and somebody asked me, they said, Alan, I thought you were going to do short videos, like anywhere from 15 to 19 minutes, but I noticed your last two to three videos were long videos. Well, one of the reasons why I've been doing longer free portion videos is because I don't really plan on doing a video like every day or every other day. Like, for example, if I planned on doing, say, five videos this week, then, yeah, each of them would be roughly about 15 to 19 minutes. But because I don't plan on doing a video every day or every other day for the, probably the next five or six weeks, because I know I'm going to be doing a lot of traveling and doing this and that. If I know I'm only going to be doing, like, say, one or two videos a week, that's why I'm allowing them to be longer. So that's the reason why they're longer. It's because, like, this week, I plan on only doing probably, like, two videos this week. Yeah, after this video, I'm only do like, one other video this week. So, like, if I was planning on doing, like, three or four more videos this week, then they would each be shorter. But, um, yeah, I don't, I'm probably only going to do one other video after this, this week. And definitely in July, like, in July, there's going to be at least probably two weeks where you might not see a video from me at all. I might go as, as long as, like, five to seven days without doing a video, particularly a free video. I might do a, a Patreon-exclusive video that I just directly upload to my Patreon page. But as far as a free video, yeah, in the month of July, I can guarantee you there's going to be at least one or two weeks in July. I'm, I'm not going to be doing any videos because I'm going to be traveling and shit. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk about a couple things in my Patreon exclusive portion for this video. So join me there.